there we are. <clears throat> Good morning, all. Hi, Nancy. Good to see you last night. And Robin Allen. Good morning to you. I hope you guys are doing okay down there. Hi, Kip. Good to see you last night, too. Linda Wolf, another person. Don Jones, Scott Johnson, good morning. Barry and Margot, good morning. Oh, everybody's piling in. It gets tough to catch, keep up with them sometimes here. Let's see here. Joan Riggs, good morning to you. And Linda Clark, and Ken Woods, and Joy and Steve Yampor, good morning. Joanne Butters, good morning. Sandy Sauerbeck, good morning. Sue McCausland, good morning. Mose and Marsha, so good to see you guys last night. Sherry Keys, good morning. Larry and Carolyn Thomas, good morning to you. Jean Hardwick, good morning. Hi, Norma Bentley. Hi, Judy Sutherland. The um, We had, um, as we wait for a little bit before nine, so we'll still have some folks joining us. We um, we had our imposition of ashes. So if uh, you didn't have a chance, um, there's a little service slash devotional for Ash Wednesday that's up. Uh, you can see that. Uh, there's a link on our Facebook page. It's also on the YouTube channel. Just something that I did, um, which would have been very similar to the service if we had that. And then last night we had the opportunity for people to sign up and come in and get position of ashes or to drive through and we actually had quite a few people come through for each one and uh, we had I think I think we were right around 45 45 folks so um, you know in the midst of a pandemic that was good it was so good to see some folks we were very safe you know we made sure that uh, everybody was masked and socially distanced and as much as we could and and when we couldn't be socially distanced, that that interaction was as, uh, as little time as possible. So, uh, and I know it meant for quite a few people. We had our, uh, we did broadcast it live over on uh, our Facebook page, a little bit of it anyway, about an hour of it, so folks could see it. And uh, we had some music playing, and Christine came in and uh, gave us some organ at one point in it. So, Kevin and Chris Vaughn, good morning. Kevin was there last night too. Hi, Paul Wolf. I think Judy, Judy Hatch, good morning. Judy Sutherland, good morning. Um, Judy Martin, good morning to you. So, um, yeah, so it was a long, it was a, a little bit of a long day yesterday, but we made it through. And um, let's see. Uh, the next big thing is our worship on Sunday. We'll, of course, we'll be on Facebook Live, YouTube with that. And... Uh, we are also, um, you'll be seeing announcements coming out about our annual meeting, which we're going to be holding at 11.30 via a Zoom call uh, on the 28th of February. So um, that's going to be new, right? We've never done that before. And um, because we can't have everybody in, uh, we're going to do it that way. Um, and that's new. So we need to practice a little bit. So on Tuesday evening, we will have just a practice Zoom call for folks that uh, might want to get used to it. Um, although many of us have gotten very used to Zoom uh, over the course of the last year, uh, so much is being done by it, and keeping in. Uh, so, and then um, what we will do is um, uh, we're see because the annual meeting there's some voting that goes on, so we do need a quorum of folks. So it's really important if you're a member to try to participate. We're going to uh, elect our elders and deacons um, and trustees and also the new nominating committee, um, which has to be done every year. So they're the people that go out and fill all the spots. We'll thank the outgoing elders and deacons um, and, uh, and trustees. Welcome the new ones. Um, I'm going to contact those folks and see if we can't have the installation, ordination installation at that time, too. We'll see see what we can do with that and if not we'll take we'll take care of that a little bit later but so there's this voting we're going to do through polling so on zoom there is the opportunity for the host to put up questions which will appear 
in the um, um, on the screen and you can vote with that. Now, if you are a multi-person family and watching together, then that means one person would vote uh, on the screen. The other people, person or people that are there would vote via the chat. So sounds like it could be, uh, we've seen other churches do this. We've seen Presbytery do this so that, that uh, and the Zoom call can be not only on computer through video, but you could also just dial in on your phone too and participate. We just need to know if you're doing that. So who you are uh, and also we'll probably, we need to, um, we need to be able to uh, get your vote in that way. So we're just going to, we're going to make sure we get it right. So Tuesday night at seven, um, we'll have that. We'll have a couple of fun questions so that people can get, get through that. Uh, and uh, let's see. Oh, Barbara Wolf. Good morning. Aunt Mary. Good morning. I see you guys down in North Carolina are going to get some, some of the weather it's moving its way up the East coast. My Aunt Mary asked about my son, Tom, who's down in Houston. Uh, I haven't heard from him today. Did talk to him yesterday and um, he is doing, they're doing okay. Uh, as good as anybody in Texas can do. They, um, he was in a house, uh, these kind of friends have banded together. They were in somebody's house who definitely had power. That went out um, the day before yesterday. So they migrated over to Tom's apartment, uh, which still had, um, uh, power, and uh, they live very, very close. To, there's numerous hospitals in the southern part of Houston, and they're down there by that. So they're hopeful that uh, that grid will stay active down there. So we'll see. They're young; they can uh, hopefully uh, make their way through. So, um, but that's a, a terrible, terrible situation down in Texas, and it's still bad today. And uh, there's supposed to be a little bit of easing, or a lot of easing of the cold down there. So we'll see what happens, but the power grid just, it can't, it couldn't handle the demand. Um, apparently the natural gas, which is used to generate most of the electricity, um, some of that went offline because of the cold temperatures. And on top of that, there was this incredible demand for heat. So it just couldn't keep up with it. So prayers, prayers for everybody down south, but especially Texas and uh, We'll see what happens. Good morning, Amy Bowerman and Tracy Krutz. Good to see you. Um, all right. So that's where we are and what we're doing. Um, so look, you'll get you'll get an email blast from Carrie about all of this stuff. And uh, we encourage everybody to uh, to participate, to participate. Now, we're still moving ahead with our uh, and we're working very hard on a couple things that I wanted to tell you about. Number one is an app. So those of you with smartphones or tablets, um, uh, Allen Park Presbyterian has an app and we are um, just uh, fooling around with it to get it really right. And uh, that will have the opportunity for people to make reservations because we'll have only limited attendance availability. And again, all of the numbers are going the right way so that we can do this. That will be March 7th. And um, but uh, we're going to make sure that everybody, if you don't, if you don't do smartphones, if you don't do apps, that there's a call-in number um, and also a link that if you just use um, Facebook, that you can click the link off of Facebook and also get uh, get that. We think that we'll probably be able to have definitely 50, 50 folks. And um, bear with us as we go through this because. You know, this is new territory, so we're trying to make uh, do all the planning. But you know, as there's an old uh, Yiddish saying that says, "Man plans and God laughs." So um, we're hoping that that's uh, and um, you know, and we want to see what the demand is. So uh, just bear with us. Give us a couple weeks of grace uh, to try to get this right. We need to see the demand. If the demand is very, very high, we need to add a service, of course, um, and. Um, but we also know that a lot of folks, you know, um, some folks have been vaccinated and feel very safe, but that's just the minority of people right now. And uh, so we need to do that. There's been questions asked about our um, our transportation. You know, we have bus that we do for quite a few uh, of our folks that um, don't have transportation. 
um, or live in assisted living, senior living. And right now, because of the pandemic, um, there's just no way that we can safely uh, pack people into a bus and bring them here. So we are, uh, right now, we can't have that transportation, but we're always looking at it. All right. So that's all the news. That's a lot of news, really, right? Okay. And we'll move over here to our um, to our readings for today. I've, uh, I've got my coffee. I hope you have some, too. Or tea or hot chocolate. Or even water. I'm not I haven't I haven't given up food for Lent, but I will admit that the pandemic uh, poundage has come up a little bit. Not terribly, but a little bit. And also going through the shoulder uh, surgery. Um, that kind of um, cuts back on your activity a little bit. And let's face it, when you're hurt, sometimes there's some good comfort food that really helps. So I am, uh, I have, uh, as I said, it's not a Lenten discipline. I'm just uh, watching what I eat and what I drink. So I've upped my uh, intake of water, finding out how good that is. So uh, here, let's go with our devotions today. Our mornings, our, our psalm for the morning is Psalm 27. Let's listen for the word of the Lord for us today. The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord that will I seek after. To live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give up to the will of my adversaries. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait the Lord. May God add his blessing to this reading, this holy word. Um, sometimes I just share with, you know, things that come into my mind as I read this, just right along with you. And one thing that I've seen is um, there's a, a congressional representative, uh, Adam Kinzinger, who's a, a Republican congressman. And he was one of the uh, Republican congressmen that that uh, voted uh, for impeachment. I don't think he's a senator. I think he's a congressman. So he voted for to bring the, the charges forward on that. And um, just like many of the Republicans um, that voted either to voted guilty as a senator or voted to forward the articles of impeachment as a congressman, um, they're getting a lot of uh, pushback. And I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the politics of the situation. But I, I bring up Adam Kinzinger for one this one reason. It's been in the paper that uh, he actually had a family member that wrote him a letter, and and um, Congressman Kinzinger cho chose to share that. And uh, but just a family member and the vitriol and the anger uh, and the hate that this the, the, his family. They said, you know, you are. Um, not only did they say that they disagreed with his vote, which is one thing, right? 
but they just uh, they tried to strip him of his humanity and then call out his understand of his relationship with God. He says, you, you know, you can't be a Christian and do what you did. So we can see that um, as we read through this psalm, we have people that are in opposition to the author of the this, of this psalm. And he talk, talks about his adversaries and how they're bearing false witness against him and how they're breathing out violence against him. And I just thought about Adam Kinsman. So um, prayers, prayers. We need to learn how to be civil again. We really do. You know, it's just uh, differences on, on how we think things should be or uh, what we should be doing. Um, you know, we need to hold that into common civil discourse when, uh, and not make it a not make it a I win and you lose situation. Because we need to seek the middle on a lot of things, and that's where the answers are. They really are. Not everything. Some things are wrong, and we just got to do it. But the middle is where we're going to find uh, where we can do an awful lot. All right. We're in Deuteronomy. So I've done a little bit of research on this because we've been reading out of Deuteronomy and I made a statement saying that, you know, I, I explained the, you know, the setting of it, but I was unsure of whether that this was Moses speaking or whether this was Joshua because Moses led the people through that and then take, takes them right to uh, the promised land. And then he actually sends Joshua and another guy over to scope it out. And they come back and they talk about, um, you know all the people that are there, but and also all these wonderful, uh, huge fruits and and vegetables and all the food that they see. This land of milk and honey, and uh, the people get scared. Oh, we just thought that it was just going to be laying there for us. So, um, and then Moses, of course, doesn't make it. He he dies before they go over, and Joshua leads the people over. So uh, Deuteronomy is just is kind of this retelling of this, uh, but this section, this chapter six and chapter seven of Deuteronomy is Moses before he dies is given. Uh, this is like the pregame speech. Get get yourself ready and let's remember all that we've been through and what God has told us and um, what we are supposed to do. So um, this is kind of like the coach talking to the team before they go out to take the field. Of course, in this case, though, Moses doesn't get to take the field. All right, so this is chapter 7, and it's verses 6 through 11. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. It was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all people. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and who repays in their own person those who reject him. He does not delay, but repays in their own person those who reject him. Therefore, observe diligently the commandment, the statutes, and the ordinances that I am commanding you today. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All right. Now we'll move into our New Testament, and we are reading a new letter. This is... Uh, the epistle to Titus, and um, it's, it's the first chapter, the first 16 verses. So Titus is this book in the New Testament, and it is, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's, we'll see right here in the title, it's Paul writing to Titus, who is um, a co-minister with him. And we know that Titus accompanied Paul, Paul mentions him in Galatians, uh, we also see it in, in Acts. Uh, so uh, Titus went up to Jerusalem with uh, Paul when he went there to meet with the apostles. Um, and it also that um, Titus was dispatched to handle some problems with some of the churches that they had founded. So 
he 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 could have been a, a captain for Paul. Um, now here's the problem. The problem is is that the letter, just like we've been reading out of First Timothy and Second Timothy, um, the letter and also Hebrews for that matter, those letters which are attributed to Paul, because it says I Paul am writing this letter to you, uh, they don't read like the ones that we know that are truly authentic Paulian, which um, uh, just everybody writes differently, right? And so those all ones hold together. These don't. The vocabulary, the sentence structure, the the, the way that uh, the arguments go. So um, there was um, there was a lot of scholarship that said that these were suedo Paulian, which means false Paul. Not again, not that they are false but that they were falsely attributed to Paul and that they were written later. Uh, and there's some really, really good arguments for that. One of which is that what we see in these letters is um, um, a more focus on um, the theology of the church rather than the theology of the apostles. So that's something that's speaking for that argument. Um, what's speaking against that is, is a more recent um, thread of, uh, of study that says, no, these really were Paul, but by that time, um, he was, he was in prison, um, which back then it, it wasn't that he was in a jail, but he was like under house arrest and he was able to have friends, uh, with him. Um, and that Paul had become much more of a CEO at that point. So he actually would, um, he would dictate and say, hey, send a letter to Titus, and this is, these are the things that I wanted to say, uh, and um, sign it in my name. Now, it means he probably reviewed it, was fully aware of it, so, but we don't know. We weren't there, but those, I just, I like everybody to understand what the current thinking is on these things, so, um, but regardless, they are authoritative pieces of scripture. They really are, so here we go. Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. Paul a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that is in accordance with godliness and the hope of eternal life that God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. In due time, he revealed his word through the proclamation with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my loyal child in the faith we share. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. I left you behind in Crete for this reason, that you should put in order what remained to be done and should appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Someone who is blameless, married only once, whose children are believers, not accused of debauchery and not rebellious. For a bishop, as God's steward, must be blameless. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or addicted to wine or violent or greedy for gain. But he must be hospitable, a lover of goodness, prudent, upright, devout, and self-controlled. He must have a firm grasp of the word that is trustworthy in accordance with the teaching, so that he may be able to both to preach with sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict it. There are also many rebellious people, idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for sordid gain what is not right to teach. It was one of them, their very own prophet, who said, Cretans are always liars, vicious brutes, lazy gluttons. That testimony is true. For this reason, rebuke them sharply so that they may become sound in the faith not paying attention to Jewish myths or to commandments of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Their very minds and conscience are corrupted. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their actions. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. This is the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. So I, I have a feeling um, that we're going to hear about this more as we move through this, but it is Thursday, so you've got some reading to do on your own on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But um, so what Titus tells us is um, it tells us the characteristics to look for for elders. Um, and in the Presbyterian Church, we elect our elders, and they actually are elected by 
uh, the congregation and, and they are the decision makers. They are the, the people who direct the church. And of course, a bishop uh, is, is somebody that's higher um, than the minister that's in any one church. We don't have bishops in the Presbyterian church, but um, in fact, if a church, if a denomination has bishops, it means that they're Episcopal in nature. And the Episcopal Church is one of them, but the Catholic Church is Episcopal, and uh, the Methodist Church is Episcopal, because they have bishops which oversee a certain region. In the Presbyterian, uh, Presbyterian polity, the way that we do things, we say that the Presbytery itself acts as a bishop. So our Presbytery is made up of churches, and um, we have elders, we have teaching elders, who are ministers, and we have ruling elders, who are lay people who have been elected by the congregation. Uh, and those people together constitute the presbytery and the presbytery is the one. So we have uh, presbytery meetings five times a year year where we get used, used to get together in person. You know, the last year it's been remote uh, through Zoom. And the presbytery is much more than just those meetings. There's everyday things that go on, such as um, identifying and qualifying people to, um, um, if, a, if a church wishes to call somebody as a minister, the presbytery will go through and make sure that that person has proper credentials and standing. Um, and also will interview that person so that the presbytery will have an indication that they think that this is a, a person who is worthy of doing it. So Paul is writing to Titus and he's uh, sent him to Crete because there's some there's some disorder in the church there. And he said, you got to take care of these things. And the biggest thing here is that, hey, pick the right people, right? Or um, pick the right people so that, that ch those churches are on the right path, right? And here's the, then he, then he says, this is the problem, right? Um, they're, they're getting people teaching in their church who are not capable. Um, and that they're they're not preaching the gospel, they're preaching for their own purposes, financial gain, apparently some of them. Um, and he's really, really upset because um, there's a lot of Jewish converts, probably people that were, maybe perhaps they were priests um, who have converted to Christianity and they're, they're, they're bringing an overtly Judaic uh, requirements into the church. And he's concerned about that. Um, and he's concerned that um, not only about the teaching, but he's concerned about their attitudes, right? Because they're looking down on people and, uh, and that they need to be rebuked. He doesn't say cast them out. He says rebuke them, right? And um, so, and the pur purpose of that rebuke is so that they will become sound in their faith and their doctrine. All right. So that's enough about Titus, I think now. And uh, we're, we're in our John uh, gospel reading, which is John, and then we're still in the first chapter here. 29 through 34. Now we've been talking about uh, John starts out in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and, and, and the word was God. Nothing came into being um, except through him. And then so we know that Jesus was with as part of the Trinity and the Holy Spirit from the very, very beginning of, of, of it wasn't just something that God decided. I'm going to create this part of myself called Christ. And then um, John, in his gospel, spends a lot of time talking about John the Baptist. That's two different Johns. We have John the Evangelist and John the Baptist because we know that there was still this thing saying, well, what was John the Baptist? Who was he? Was he was he the Messiah? Uh, and who was he? So um, so he, he's going, he goes, he spends some very valuable space talking about this, trying to put this right. So this is where we pick it up. The next day, he, John, saw Jesus coming towards him and declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who rakes ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen 
and have testified that this is the Son of God. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. You know, uh, when we read scripture, sometimes it just doesn't flow and sometimes there's tensions. We read things, we go, well, wait a second, didn't I read something that spoke against that or, or took another thing? And that's what we call tension and we need to live with it. We need to know that it's there. My only problem that I have with reconciling this is that we know that John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus um, and that um, that he knew of Jesus and that that uh, Mary and his mother Elizabeth um, when they were both pregnant had had gotten together that's revealed um, so you would think well maybe they at least got together a few times when they were kids and they had this idea and certainly certainly uh, Jesus was not unknown to him. Now, maybe he's saying he wasn't, it wasn't known to him that he was going to be the Messiah until he had this theophany of what was going on. But um, it's a tension, you know, it's a tension that we, that pulls us in two different directions, and we just we need to we need to be able to live with that tension. All right, come over here. Oh, Barry and Margo are filling in there. Hi, Jolyn. Hi, Ann Winslow. And hi, Corey Lockridge. Hi, Amy Bowerman. I'm just looking, catching up on some of the things that might have been said here. All right. Well, and the other thing I wanted to talk about, because and I wanted to talk about this before we prayed, is that uh, Stella Miglior did pass away on the 16th of February. She was 90 years old and passed very, very peacefully. And uh, I have been in contact with the family, uh, her son Rich in particular, and um, they're not quite sure. Or, there's nothing that's going to happen immediately. Um, Stella will be interred in the columbarium here. Um, but because of the COVID and because of the family that's kind of spread out, they're trying to figure out the best way to handle that. So we need to pray for them and with them. Um, so um, maybe, you know, as soon as we have any of that information, um, you know, we'll, we'll get that to you. So, but right now we need to, and she was such a dear, dear person. So I know that this has impacted so many folks from Allen Park Presbyterian Church and, um, uh, so, but she is with the Lord now. She is with the Lord. She was 90 years old. So the Lord blessed us with an incredible uh, number of people. I was talking to her son, Rich, and um, he was telling me that uh, of recent, um, um, she had lived with him for a bit uh, in, the, in the pandemic and that they were trying to, uh, he was trying to get kind of an oral history from her and they were talking about the church. And he says, we got right up into about the mid 50s. And uh, he says, we, did, we didn't go any further than that. And, um, but then he did say that, um, that, that um, um, he did say that, uh, that she had been watching our services online, you know, uh, some, and that she had been very, very pleased with them. I had the opportunity to see her uh, in the fall um, and um, late in the fall when we baptized a great granddaughter. So. Um, but it was, uh, because I was talking to Rich and he said, I said, oh, well, that's, that was, uh, I won't call it the heyday, but that was one of the high points of, of the Allen Park church history, of course, was, was Wanzer Brunel. And she, he goes, oh yes. He says, I knew Wanzer. And, uh, and, uh, also the, they were raised in the church. And I said, well, that would also have been about the time that the, that the new, um, the new church, the new sanctuary was built, was open too. And he said, yes, he did remember that here. So prayers for that and prayers for our grief share group uh, led by Norma Bentley and assisted by Carrie Van. Uh, today's Thursday, so they'll be meeting tonight. That's really uh, so sacred and but, and but difficult ground that um, that Norma and Carrie are leading those folks through. And so we pray, we pray for them and uh, it's such a vital ministry. All right, let's pray. 
Lord, we come to you uh, today, and uh, we first give thanks for taking us through another evening and giving us another sunrise. Our thoughts and our prayers go with uh, Stella's family, and um, Lord, she rests with you, and uh, we just thank you for the so many years that you gave us this dear, dear person, that she had a love for you. And uh, we know that when the time came and you asked, uh, are you ready? And she was ready to say yes, that she is. Um, she rests with you and the saints. And that our time of separation, although sor sorrowful and mournful at this time, that Lord, there's going to be a time when uh, we are all together in the kingdom where there's neither sighs nor suffering nor tears. And then, Lord, we also pray for those folks who are um, in uh, that who are ill in uh, need of healing, we continue to pray for pandemic victims and, and everyone who is, uh, on, and we've heard so many people that have had uh, procedures, both major and minor, and that they've come through. We pray for the, the webs, uh, who, uh, that uh, Woody continues to recover. And Lord, um, we ask that we pray that he would gain strength and be able to come home. And then, Lord, as uh, we also gather here, we've read your letters, we've seen the cautions that have just existed, that we need to know of your statutes, your ordinances. We need to open our hearts so that the Holy Spirit can be there and guide us that what's most important to you is how we treat each other and how we honor and love you. So, Lord, it isn't about who's right and who's wrong. It's really about our compassion and our care. We know that there's some people who will abuse that. And Lord, that's up to you to handle. But in the meantime, uh, just create in us a clean heart. Give us the opportunity to make amends, to repair relationships, and to move forward. And Lord, let us always rely on the promises that you made, that you will always be with us. We ask all of this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, all. And um, we are, um, today's Thursday, and sometimes I do Fridays. We did last Fridays, but I think I'm going to take next, I'm going to take tomorrow off. And um, it's Lent. Um, we've, we've had a lot going on and um, just, uh, I'm going to take, I'm going to try to take a day of rest, if you don't mind. And uh, well, if you mind, I'm still taking a day of rest. Um, we need to practice self-care through all those things. And Barbara Wolf is asking for some additional prayers for uh, Pat's uh, statue uh, or stacko or statue. In your prayers, she faces a real struggle with visits from her family and friends. Amen. Absolutely. We lift, we lift her up in prayer, too. All right. So, friends, God bless you. Thank you for joining with us today. If you're in need of prayer and, um, and didn't feel that we covered it here, um, always feel free to reach out. Pastor Tim. P-A-S-T-O-R, P-A-S-T-O-R-T-I-M at Allen Park Press, P-R-E-S dot org. Um, you can always get a hold of me there, even on, even on my days that I'm not, that I'm not here. All right. God bless you all and um, love you all and have a blessed day. Be safe. Bye-bye.